Chapter 22 is over complications during pregnancy. So embryonic development is three to eight weeks after fertilization. Organogenesis, I mentioned this in the last chapter, is the formation of the basic functional elements of the organ systems, development of the major body systems. It's a critical time in development of all the organs and structures. By the end of week eight, all of the organs are formed. So during this first three to eight weeks after fertilization is really um, the most critical period. Exposure of the embryo to teratogens can cause serious congenital abnormalities. A teratogen, again, I mentioned this last chapter, but it's any substance or situation that causes a developmental abnormality. This could be a virus or smoking or mom being exposed to secondhand smoke. Another reason not to smoke, right? Um, it can lead to your baby having a low birth weight, increased irritability, and possibly even having a stillbirth or a miscarriage. Alcohol is a risk throughout the whole pregnancy. Fetal alcohol syndrome impairs the child's neurological and intellectual development. Um, radiation is also harmful, and certain medications, even herbal remedies, can be harmful. It's important to check with your doctor and or the pharmacist to see what you can take during pregnancy. A lot of times our patients think that if it's over the counter, it's safe. Um, and again, this is not your farm class, but um, they think if it's over the counter, it's safe. But we really have to teach them to discuss this with their provider because um, some over the counter medications even are not safe during pregnancy. Um, pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. They're approximately three months each. Um, we can do different um, diagnoses to, you know, or different things to diagnose a pregnancy. Presence of HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin in the mother's plasma or urine, or urine is a laboratory diagnosis, but the absolute signs of pregnancy happen later in pregnancy, including a heartbeat. Um, we can do this by listening or by ultrasound more often. The estimated delivery date or estimated um, date of birth, EDD or EDB, is calculated using Nagel's rule. Um, Nagel's rule is three months are subtracted from the date of the last menstrual period and then seven days are added. So it's going to give you um, a due date, basically. If someone has a longer cycle or an irregular cycle, we might have to adjust that formula. Um, I'm not going to um, give you test questions res uh, like regarding calculating Nagel's rule, just know that term Nagel's rule would be how you would calculate the estimated um, due date. Um, a gestational age is two weeks longer than the biological age. This is a length of time since the first day of the last menstrual period. Um, and then, you know, you have 280 days or 40 weeks, like I said, um, to calculate that Nagel's rule. Just know that Nagel's rule is how you calculate the due date. We have some terms related to pregnancy. So gravidity and parity. Um, this is a woman's history of pregnancy and childbirth. So gravidity is the number of pregnancies they've had and a prima gravida is a first time pregnant woman. And then parity is the number of pregnancies where the fetus has reached viability. So when we talk about, about viability, it's um, how to, or the ability for the, the baby to um, survive outside of the uterus. So um, a lot of times when we talk about parity, we talk about um, like live births as well. Um, so I know that you can be, you know, viable outside of the uterus at like 20 something weeks, um, but that doesn't mean that they resulted in a live birth. So most of the time you're going to see that gravidity is the number of pregnancies and then parity is the number of live births that they have had. Um, so those can obviously be different because some people have been pregnant many times and had miscarriages or stillbirths. Um, so, you know, again, those, those are not always the same for every patient. A multipara has completed two or more pregnancies with viability. Um, so, you know, th again, this is how we talk about um, our pregnant women's histories. An amniocentesis is withdrawing a small amount of amniotic fluid after the 14th week, and we check the fluid for the chemical context or contents, and we can culture the cells um, and do chromosome analysis with it. And then a chorionic villi sampling is an alternative process earlier in the pregnancy. Um, we use this for chromosomal examination and diagnosing high-risk clients. Actually, this chorionic villi, villi sample, sampling is how a lot of people find out the sex of the birth or the sex of the baby early on in pregnancy. 
pregnancy. Most people don't want to wait until those sex characteristics are um, visible on ultrasound. So they'll do the CVS um, to, you know, to determine the sex of the baby. And then, you know, also to determine if there are any issues with the pregnancy, etc. So as we know, the woman changes during pregnancy. There's hormonal changes, reproductive system changes, there's weight gain, nutritional changes as far as needs go, um, changes in the digestive system, musculoskeletal system, cardiovascular system. Um, the whole body basically changes during pregnancy to accommodate the growing fetus. Um, for hormones, the level of estrogen and progesterone increase in pregnancy, which is essential to, develop, to development of the uterus, maintenance of the pregnancy, and preparation for lactation or milk production. Hyperplasia of the thyroid and increased thyroxine production also happen, increasing mom's metabolism. That's why pregnant women get so hot and so hungry. <laughs> Um, the uterus gets bigger, causing hypertrophy of the muscle cells. The vascularity of the cervix and vagina increase, softening the tissue and producing more mucus to protect the uterine contents. The vagina also becomes more acidic to deter infectious organisms, and the breasts start to enlarge. The pressure of the growing uterus can interfere with digestion. It reduces vital capacity, which is how much air you can breathe out after you take a deep breath. It increases the pressure on the bladder and the rectum and changes the center of gravity for the pregnant woman. The average weight gain is 25 to 30 pounds from the growing uterus and its contents, um, enlarged breasts and additional blood volume. There is an increased demand for protein, carbs, fats, vitamins, and minerals, so it's important to get enough of all of those as well as enough calcium and iron. This is an average of what everything weighs. Again, everything is different from person to person, but here's an average for you. The baby is roughly eight pounds, placenta, placenta another two to three pounds, amniotic fluid two to three pounds, breast tissue two to three pounds, and then more or extra blood supply about four pounds. Um, there is stored fat for delivery and breastfeeding about five to nine pounds. Um, if there's a large, the larger uterus, sorry, is going to weigh another two to five pounds. So again, total 25 to 35 pounds, but these are all average. Um, but really, this is normal. Some people feel like they have to gain quite a bit more um, or or they do gain quite a bit more. This is this is um, enough to meet the body's needs to grow the baby. So pretty classic for pregnancy is nausea and vomiting, especially in the first trimester. We call this morning sickness, but it's not just in the morning. Um, changing the eating pattern helps. Progesterone relaxes the smooth muscle, so there's slower emptying of the stomach causing reflux or heartburn as well as constipation. There's an increased blood volume for baby, so mom needs more iron. Mom's heart rate increases and blood pressure usually drops a little bit in the first two trimesters, but comes back up in the third trimester. And varicose veins often develop during pregnancy related to that increase in blood volume, um, as well as um, you know edema and things like that. There's an increased blood volume for baby, so mom needs more iron, like I said. Um, the heart rate, sorry, I believe that this is just a duplicate of the last slide, but yeah, that heart rate increases um, and then varicose veins can develop. So some complications, um, ectopic pregnancy, preeclampsia and eclampsia, gestational diabetes, placental disorders, blood clotting disorders, RH incompatibility, infection, and adolescent pregnancy, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these. An ectopic pregnancy is when the fertilized egg is implanted outside of the uterus, usually in the fallopian tube, so you might hear it called a tubal pregnancy. Um, this can lead to a spontaneous abortion or the embryo can continue to develop. It will eventually cause tubal rupture if this happens and severe hemorrhaging can lead to shock and death. An ectopic pregnancy is a surgical emergency. The fetus is not viable outside of the uterus. The embryo has to be removed. Pregnancy-induced hypertension, or PIH, is persistently elevated blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, consistently, not just one time with high blood pressure. Um, it develops later in pregnancy, like the last half, like 20 weeks or later. It can lead to a stroke or damage to the retina, and it returns to normal, usually after delivery. Um, most effective treatment is delivery. Monitoring is required throughout pregnancy if it is too early to deliver. Higher incidences in prima gravida or first baby is noted. Um, teenage pregnancy or women, women with little or no prenatal care as well are at high risk. 
preeclampsia is progressively higher blood pressure. You'll see kidney dysfunction, weight gain, generalized edema, and HELP syndrome is a complication. This stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Eclampsia is extremely high blood pressure that can lead to seizures or coma. Um, these patients are at very high risk of stroke. When this is the case, we have to get that baby out. Sometimes a C-section is needed to do this and it's an emergency because mom is at such great risk. Gestational diabetes or diabetes develops in um, a small percentage of women. It can lead to developmental abnormalities if the blood glucose level is very high in the first trimester. Um, newborns are usually high um, weight or large for gestational age. They can experience hypoglycemia after birth as well because they're so used to mom circulating sugar that the pancreas makes insulin to um, to manage that, and then when they're born, they no longer have mom circulating sugar or high sugar, um, but they have you know all of this extra insulin, so hypoglycemia, which is okay. We just have to monitor it and give them glucose as necessary. Um, glucose levels should be closely monitored in women that have a family history of diabetes or have had previously high birth weight infants. Um, so usually we can treat gestational diabetes with dietary management and exercise, um, but we may need to give insulin to reduce the blood glucose level. Um, we don't use any oral hypoglycemics. We would only use insulin with pregnant women. Placenta previa, this is when the placenta is implanted in the lower uterus over the cervical os or the passage between the uterus and the cervix. It can tear at the end of pregnancy. It's painless, but you'll see bright red bleeding. It can be dangerous, so mom will be on bed rest and they might need a C-section if the placenta is completely in the way. A placenta abruption is premature separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. The bleeding might not be evident vaginally depending on where the tear happens, but it will be dark red and very painful. This is common after a car accident, but can happen spontaneously as well. And then we have blood clotting problems. So thromboembolism or blood clots, this is common after childbirth. It usually develops in the, lanes, the veins of the legs or pelvis. Thrombophlebitis is when a clot forms over an inflamed area in the vein wall. And an embolus is, a piece, is when a piece of that thrombus breaks away and it can flow with the venous blood. It can result in a pulmonary embolus, um, you know, heart attack, stroke. We've talked about all of that in cardiovascular. And we've talked about DIC and cardiovascular before. Remember, it's excessive hemorrhaging and clotting at the same time. It's a serious complication of another condition, um, like an abrupted placenta or preeclampsia. Um, there's an increased activation of the clotting mechanism, so there will be multiple blood clots throughout circulation. Um, and then again, it, there will be lots of um, bleeding, hemorrhaging at the same time. And then we have RH incompatibility. This is when mom is RH negative and baby is RH positive. It's usually not a problem in the first pregnancy, but when mom delivers and the placenta tears, RH positive blood enters mom's circulation and stimulates the formation of antibodies in mom. In later pregnancies, mom's RH antibodies cross the placenta to the fetus and cause antigen antibody reactions in the fetus, destroying its red blood cells, leading to severe anemia, low hemoglobin, heart failure, or even death. So we'll usually deliver early or give an intra, um, intrauterine transfusion. We can also do an exchange transfusion after birth. We do blood testing on mom um, and baby to monitor for RH antibodies, or sorry, we do blood testing on mom to monitor for RH antibodies. We also give Rogam to mom after delivery to suppress the immune system response, preventing sensitization of mom when baby's red blood cells enter her system. And then our last complication or our last issue with pregnancy is adolescent pregnancy. Um, teenagers have an increased nutritional need to meet the demands of their own growth. Um, and pregnancy at this time has an increased risk of complications. Anemia is a very common problem. Um, babies born to adolescent moms frequently weigh less than normal or um, are preterm. Labor and delivery can be very difficult because there's an immature pelvis in adolescence um, and pregnancy in, um, induced hypertension is very common.